Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and uses the imaginary Airzatz Coffee Shop as its platform to bring you a conversation about a plethora of scintillating topics. We don't shy away from any issue that is plaguing our culture or the church today, whether it's current cultural issues, questions about Bible verses, or even just some banter to encourage you. Dr. Jay Christensen is the Truth Barista, and he and amazing Larry Kutzler brew up highly caffeinated conversations for our day. Grab a cup of joe, pop yourself down in the booth next to us, and get ready to think. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry, and it's listener-supported. For more information about The Truth Barista, go to highbeamministry.com. Thanks for listening. All right, you have to learn to pray. You learn to pray in the same way. Lord, teach us to pray. Now remember, in living this Christian life, you don't have to live it alone. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The moment you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you to give you the power, the strength, the wisdom, the courage to live the Christian life. Now the Holy Spirit also helps in your prayer life. The scripture says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit helps you to pray. Now, may I make a suggestion? There are so many people that say, well, I don't feel like praying. I only pray when I feel like it. Then you're wrong. You should have a definite time and place every day to pray. You have an appointment. You have an interview with Almighty God. Well, every day, God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is waiting. He has given you an audience at any time of the day, and you fail to keep your appointment. Have a definite time that you set aside and pray when you least feel like it. The will is involved here too. You say, I don't feel like it. All right, your emotion, your body says, I don't feel like it. My mind says, I don't feel like praying. My will makes me go and spend time in prayer because prayer is work. And many times you make yourself keep your appointment with God and out of some of those moments come your most precious moments and some of your greatest answers to prayer. This is The Truth Barista, perfecting the art of telling the truth. Thanks for joining us. Dr. J, we've been talking about prayer on the program, and boy, I tell you, I walk away from our conversations every week with something that I meditate on all week long. For example, last week you were talking just about how God will heal the land if we actually will repent and turn from our wicked ways. But at the end of the program, I said to you, but what about those people in our audience who feel like, I'm just not worthy to pray. I can't go to the throne of grace because, well, I just don't feel worthy. What would you say to them? Well, speaking from experience, I can say, yeah, we're not worthy. Wow. I mean, when you think of it as a sinful human being, our sin, our unholiness, our unholy state, our that makes us so utterly unlike God, there's nothing in that that makes us worthy to approach a holy God. What we need is for God to make us holy and draw us near to Him. It's like, if I don't receive the invitation, and yet I go to the wedding anyway, I'm called, what? The wedding crasher. Hmm. I don't have the authority. I don't have the invitation to be there. However, it would be very disrespectful of me if I received the invitation and just threw it in the in the garbage. Imagine this. I've got the invitation and I'm sitting outside of the door of the fellowship hall or the reception hall or wherever the wedding feast is taking place. And I just stand there and go, you know, I'm just, I'm just not worthy to go to this wedding reception. Why are you unworthy? The Lord has given you an invitation. You know, the host has given you an invitation. That's almost a false sense of humility, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And false humility is actually pride. Let that one sink in. I, Ouch! You know, I want to be escorted in, you know. But no, it's true. I mean, just from my own feelings, because I've grappled with this too, Lord. I've sinned. I'm not worthy to even speak to you. And God says, what are you talking about? I gave you every way that you need to get rid of that sin so you can answer my invitation and come into my presence. Now think of this. Adam and Eve were driven from God's presence because of their sin. 
God even put an angel and a flaming sword to make sure we wouldn't get back into his presence without the authority to do so. Now, I had one of my students, I, I teach a Torah class, an Old Testament class, first five books of the Bible on Tuesday nights. And she said, what is this flaming sword that was there? Well, in my mind, I use the rabbinic method of, okay, where are swords mentioned in Scripture? And the first thing that came to my mind, and this had to be the Holy Spirit, he said, my word is like a two-edged sword. So it was an angel, which is oftentimes God's presence, and his word that keeps us from coming to him unauthorized. Why? Because if we do, God has to judge sin, and the wages of sin, amazing Larry, is death. death. Mm -hmm. And so out of mercy, God keeps humanity at arm's length. Now, he's not content with that. He wants us to be back with him. And so, from the third chapter of Genesis, when he gave what theologians call as the Proto-Evangelion, which is the first gospel, which is where God says to the snake, you're going to bruise the woman's seed, her offspring, you're going to bruise his heel, oh, but he's going to crush your head. You know, that's the whole gospel right there. One of Eve's descendants is going to destroy Satan. And in the process of destroying Satan, he's going to open the door for us to come back into God's presence. In other words, we're going to re-enter Eden. And the flaming sword that kept us out before now becomes the thing that points the way to the door back into God's presence. And so, once God gets rid of the sin issue, he offers the invitation, come, come on in, come to the table. I love the way Isaiah puts it, you without bread, come and eat freely. If you want water, oh, I got water, I got everything you need, just come on in. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting all excited. Yes. So if God has given us an invitation, who are we to pridefully say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, but your way of salvation and your way of cleansing me is just not good enough to handle my sin. And so I stand here rejecting this, saying, but I am unworthy. Okay, let's get real here. You are worthy because he has made you worthy, and you can freely enter his presence because he has given you the one he has made worthy, the invitation. Well, you said get rid of the sin, but sometimes it's just plain old-fashioned guilt. I just can't feel free from my guilt because of things I've done or things I think about, whatever. But even that is covered with Jesus, right? Exactly. Now, that's a really interesting thing that you brought up there, and we should talk about this a little bit. What brings guilt to us? What is guilt relative to this whole thing with God? Guilt is knowing you've done something wrong, isn't it? Well, I think so. I mean, when you're a kid and you your parents said, don't eat any cookies before dinner, and what do you do? You get into the cookie jar and you eat cookies before dinner. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to talk to your parents. They don't even have to catch you. You know darn well what you just did. And so that sense of, I've done something wrong, begins to grow within you. That's guilt. Okay, so if you get rid of the sin, does that get rid of the guilt, Mr. Larry? I, some people, yes. It's one and the same. But other people, not so much. I mean, it's easy to forgive other people, as they say, rather than forgive yourself. Yourself is the hardest person to forgive. And I think we've got a lot of wounded Christians walking around. They're full of guilt. They're full of condemnation. Yet they, they say, they claim all the promises of God but they still live in guilt. Yep, I agree, and I've experienced that myself. There, there are times when I know I've sinned and I feel guilty, and I come to the Lord and I confess my sin, because that's what Scripture says. And one of my favorite ever scriptures is 1 John 1, 8, 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're kidding ourselves. And the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just. See, it's not on us, it's on Him. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins... See, there's the basis for guilt, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the aspect of that sin. If you get rid of those two things, guilt has nothing to hang on to. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. And we can stand clean without guilt before him. So to 
maintain that guilt, if we still feel we have these feelings of guilt, number one, we either haven't really done business with God and aren't forgiven, or we are forgiven, but we won't admit it because we often want to punish ourselves. Mm. See, that's the, that's the whole idea behind guilt. What gets rid of guilt? Punishment. If you do something wrong, you need to be punished. Well, I know I've done something wrong, so I know I need to be punished. But if somebody looks at you and say, oh, I forgive you, you're going, you mean you're not going to punish me? No, I forgive you. I still feel like I've done something wrong. Why? Because I haven't experienced the punishment. And we have to learn to be able to look at that and say, Jesus took the punishment for this. I don't have to. I don't need punishment to make it right. Because if I use punishment and afflict myself in punishment, this is not the humbling affliction, this is using punishment as a way to do away with my sense of guilt, then I'm basically looking at Jesus' sacrifice and saying, sorry, Lord, that's not good enough. So I have to look at God and say, it is good enough. Why? Because my Father says it's good enough. And I tell you, when that revelation hits you, you will know such freedom. And it may take a while because we are so conditioned to be, you know, I need to be punished for what I did. Mm -hmm. You know, you see this. Oh, you see this throughout history. You ever see the, the monks that would do nothing but, you know, they would scourge their backs mm -hmm. with whips or they would crawl on their knees or do penance before God? That it really wasn't a change your wicked ways. But it was, if I just do this kind of a physical act or spiritual thing or, you know, I'm actually paying the price myself. And, and God goes, no, you can't. That's not the currency we use in heaven here. Sorry, your money's no good here. So take your self-flagellation and all these things and throw it away. This is the only currency in heaven, and it's the blood of Jesus. Mm. So let that pay your debt. And once your debt's been paid, let the guilt go. Oh, that's so good. Dr. J, I want to change topics just a little bit. I want to come back to what you were talking about last week and the week before, and that Second Chronicles 7.14, the area where if we repent, we get rid of the sin, that he will heal our land. That fascinates me, because when I think about, you know, healing our land, say for America, if there's, you know, if we can just say, you know, if we do all these things, will God heal our land? Well, the question I have is... Is Jeremiah in his uh, seventh chapter says, listen, these people are not listening at all. They're ignoring me. They're just not following me. Don't, You're saying God is saying that through Jeremiah, He correct? is saying that through yep. Jeremiah. Don't pray for these people. Don't pray for these people. Now, that's an odd thing to say, right? For God to say this? That's strange. I mean, how do you heal a land if God doesn't listen to you? That's the point. It wasn't time to heal the land. It was time to judge the people. In God's purposes, and this is something that isn't preached a lot from many pulpits, and many Christians don't consider this, but there comes a time when God says, enough is enough, and the sword drops on that particular land or on that person or on that people, organization, whatever it is. God has his limits. Now, his patience is extremely long-suffering, mm -hmm. all right? Why? Well, Peter says that, you know, Jesus hasn't come back right away. Why? Because God doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to be saved and come to him. However, there are times that we see in the Bible, and we can see these observed times in history, when God looks at a people or a land or a kingdom or whatever and says, I have had enough. Like, there's this old comedy routine where... <laughs> <laughs> the comedian was saying about how he and his wife are dealing with the kids and they're arguing back and forth. And finally, like the father says, I have had it. Let the beatings commence. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he likens it to a hockey game. And he's going, the kids are the puck and he's got the hockey stick, you know, the spanking rule. And he's going after the hockey pucks and his wife is serving as the goalie and she's kicking the kids back into play. You know, it's just, it's hilarious, but it's kind of like, that's what I see in my head when I'm reading through the scriptures and I hit Jeremiah and God says, I have had enough. This is it. There comes a time when if we reject God's advances and his urgings and his cajoling and everything else he does to get us to turn from our wicked ways, when he says, fine, then you will enjoy the full measure of what you deserve. We see it in Israel, the nation of Israel. 
we see it when it split and it became the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. That was a punishment. We saw it when the Assyrians came in in 722 BC and they took out the Israelites, the northern kingdom. That was a punishment. When the Babylonians came in around 586 BC and they took out the southern kingdom of Judah, that was a punishment. Why? Because the people rejected God's offer and his commands. I mean, they just outright said, no, we're not going to do it. Not going to do it. Okay, so fast forward, and this is what I love to do in teaching, is going from the ancient to the first century with Jesus' day. Isn't it fascinating when Jesus came, most of his interactions, yeah, were with a lot of people, but his most pointed interactions was with the leadership. Why? Because he is Israel's Messiah. And at that time, he came to the leaders of Israel, and they were spiritual leaders. There was no separation of church and state here. It was church and state together. So he came to the leadership, and he said, I'm the Messiah. And he demonstrated it to him. And basically, by the time you get to his crucifixion day, he has laid it all out before them. And what did they do? They rejected him. They said, you are not our king we have no king but Caesar. And just prior to that, Jesus looked at Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and kill the ones sent to you, how I have longed to gather you under my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you refused to do so. And now your house, according to how it's listed and said in Luke, now your house is left to you desolate. And you know, within 40 years, by the way, 40 is an interesting biblical number because it's the number of judgment. And within 40 years of Jesus' death, the Romans showed up in Jerusalem because of the ruckus that was going on in Jerusalem, and they leveled the city and the temple was burned down. See, there comes a point when God says, I've had it. So now that brings us to an interesting question. Has the United States reached that point? It's well, really hard to determine. Yeah, isn't it's it? really hard. And I, you know, when you say heal the land, I mean that's de- again conditional. If we repent, he'll heal the land. Well, even if the church doesn't repent. In fact, I have a friend who is so mad at the church, especially a lot of leaders in the church, because he doesn't see them leading like like the Scripture teaches. And I said, well, you can't just spend your time thinking about about their inadequacies. You've got to depend on the grace of God in prayer and don't give up like you were saying early. Don't give up praying because criticism of these leaders doesn't do anything except criticize them, but let's pray. And let's seek God for healing in their hearts that they may be saved and they may change their their tune or their message. And I think that's the indicator of how close a nation is to coming under God's judgment is whether there are people who are even willing to seek his face. And it's not the lost out there, it's the people of God, because that's the cornerstone of what we just pointed out in Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, mm-hmm. who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. That's the core. Now, healing of the land is an interesting thought, and I've done a lot of studying in Genesis, and I just find it, the first three chapters, absolutely fascinating, because God created the heavens and the earth, and so here you have the earth, and the word for ground is Adama, A-D-A-M-A-H, Adama. And so God creates this being out of the earth, the Adama, and guess what he names him? Adam. Adam. So in a sense, it's not like Adam is the name Steve or Bob, you know, or Fred or Floyd or anything like that. It's Dirt Boy. <laughs> Come on. Dirt boy? If you look if you look at it, it's kinda of like he's going, Hey dirt, get over here. <laughs> Because it's Adam from the Adama. And to me, that's really fascinating because sin entered the Adam of the Adama and it affected the Adama of the earth. Because God said, from this point on, Adam, the Adama will no longer respond to you as it has. Why? Sin has infected it. And so now I'm thinking, hmm. And I will heal their land. When people repent of their sin, they themselves improve. You see them beginning to improve and become healthy in their mind, their will, and their emotions, but also in their bodies. In fact, I have a a dear friend of mine. When I first met her, she was in some pretty heavy-duty sin. 
I'm just going to lay that out there. She was in some heavy duty sin. She was highly depressed. I looked at her and it's like, wow, what a broken person. And after a year, she gave her life to the Lord. Over the next two to three years, I watched as her mind sharpened up, her emotions lifted, her body began healing, she had more energy, she had more vibrancy, she went to Bible school, she went to the mission field twice, she is still actively involved with the, and I looked and I said, like, God, you have transformed the land of her life. You have healed that land. Now, it doesn't mean she's like superhuman or has a glorified body, but she's healthy in body, soul, and spirit. So I'm thinking, okay, Lord, if you do that to one person, what would happen if your entire body on earth sought your face? Hmm, how would the body of Christ look compared to the people who aren't belonging to God as far as their mind, their soul, and their spirit, and their bodies being healthy? Okay, if you've looked at that movie Transformations, Transformations 2, and Let the Sea Resound by George Otis Jr., you see where a group of Christians in a South American village that has been under intense occult activity have turned away from it and sought God's face. Not only has he healed them, and it's become a vibrant community of people seeking God, you should see the ground produce food. I mean, I can hold a bushel basket in my arm and there are cabbage heads much larger than that. I They pull up carrots from the ground that are as big as your forearm. It's, it's amazing how productive the land has become. Where it was once dry, suddenly rain is falling. Okay, another example. Over in, and I wish I could remember where this was. I don't know if it was Fiji. I think it was Fiji. There's a stream that's running through the village. Nobody would drink of the water. Why? It was bad. It was poison. You know, you drink it, you get sick. Nothing would grow near it. It was like there was a poison <laughs> going through the water. So these people got together. They hadn't even thought about it. They got together and they prayed and they sought God's face. They turned from their wicked ways. And all of a sudden, God started moving through the people in a revival. And that stream became fresh water. And everything on the side of it began to flourish. And the people flourished. And the land began to flourish. Okay, can the same thing happen in the United States? We see the western part of the United States. The Colorado River is drying up. There's a whole county out there that's going to go dry in a few weeks. Seriously, no water where there once was water flowing through there. Now, part of that is mismanagement. But God has poured out a drought, I believe, on the United States, especially the western half of it. Could we change the weather if we were to return to God? Why not give it a try? What's it gonna hurt? Right. You know, it's like you know, if it if it works, then great. All this water comes and the land is nourished, etc. But really, the truth be told, it's this land pointing to my body, your land, your body. It's every believer's body. That's the land that needs to be healed first. And when that's first, society will be healed, and the land, I believe, will be healed. Well, I'm going to throw you a curve, Dr. J. Oh, and I'm putting on my spiritual and, and I know catcher's we're, mid-ear. <laughs> we're almost at the end of our time, but if you can't answer this in the time that is allotted, I, well, let's come back and, and deal with it. My pastor has preached and talked a lot about the broken people in the congregation that are carrying offenses and, and things that they just can't get rid of. They're broken. And so brokenness just begots more brokenness. So they never seem to grow. They come back with the same issues, the same conditions that they have for, for, for a long time. So let's talk about that. The offenses people are carrying and they just can't let it go. Is that the kind of sin that many Christians are holding on to and can't get freedom? Wow. Talk about unpacking something in like two seconds. Excuse me, Amazing Larry, could you define the universe and give me three examples? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's a tease for next week, right? Oh my goodness, that's going to be a big one. Well, let me put it as I see it, in one way, because I've carried offenses. I've had unforgiveness and things in my life. Number one, what really helps is to realize that these types of things, offenses and unforgiveness, they're still sins. They need to be confessed and throw yourself on God's mercy. Holy Spirit, I need help with this. In one situation that really helped me, I found myself unable to forgive another person. And it continually gnaws at me. It keeps coming at me. One day, the Holy Spirit spoke to me deeply and he said, unforgiveness is simply wanting to punish the other person. You believe that they have not been punished for what they've done to you. And so I said, say that 
differently. You let me understand this. And the Holy Spirit said, when you forgive somebody, you refuse the right to punish them. Wow. Once he said that to me, all of a sudden I could feel this. It's not my responsibility to punish them. There's no grounds for me to punish them. Everything that they did in the past, I can't go back and change that. So I can put this into God's hands and God will deal with it. So the next time the person came to mind, I began to feel that pang of, oh, I just want to see him get it in Jesus' name. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, smite them with thousands of thunderbolts. And God says, sorry, that's not your gig. Mm. Forgiveness is refusing the right to punish them. And it means refusing the right to go to God and say, God, you punish them. And so that helps me deal with the recurring feelings that come up. People say, I'm going to forgive and forget. It's really tough to forget, especially if you've been wounded very, very deeply. However, the healing comes when we can refuse to punish the other person despite the pain that we have. And then we realize there is a day coming when there will be no more tears. Every wrong will be righted. Every right will be rewarded. And we will all come to peace in Jesus. Truth Barista Show listeners, this is Dr. J. Christensen, and I want to challenge you to take a deep dive into your Bibles this year. How? By reading through your Bible in 2023, and I want to help you. Cruising Through the Bible is High Beam Ministries' year-round Bible reading schedule and commentary. All you have to do is follow the schedule in the book and read a few chapters of the Bible every day. Then, check out my thoughts on the day's reading. Now, I get it. The Bible is often hard to understand because it's written for ancient and first century people and we're only about 2,000 years removed from them. That's why I wrote Cruising Through the Bible to help you understand what you're reading and to connect what you've read with the rest of the Bible and make God's Word a part of your life. So, take the challenge. You'll find Cruising Through the Bible on Amazon.com. Go to Amazon.com, search Cruising Through the Bible, and you'll find it in monthly installments for print or Kindle. No huge commitment, although as a follower of Jesus, you really should know his whole word. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. But, Dr. J, what if I miss the beginning? What if I miss a day? Well, that's the beauty of it. You can jump in anytime you want. Remember, God's Word is alive, and no matter what you read, even the tough or the weird-to-you part, God will still speak to you and into your life. So, take the Read Through the Bible in a Year Challenge, and let me help you. Go to Amazon.com, type in Cruisin' Through the Bible, and get started now. Oh, and coffee. Don't forget coffee. Coffee helps a lot. Okay, fine. Tea's good, too. So, just start cruising through the Bible today. Get High Bee Ministries Cruising Through the Bible on Amazon.com. the truth today? Dr. Jay Christensen is the truth barista and the founder of High Beam Ministry. Jay is a creative person who wants to use the setting of an imaginary cafe to produce a series of radio and internet programs that confront the issues of our day through the lens of the Bible. The Truth Barista was the avenue that was developed to communicate truth using the Bible as the source of our information. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and can be found online at highbeamministry.com. 